Smith, just want to say thank you uh, to Lebanon. And I, um, as I was listening to Ryan talk about Lebanon, I just uh, could echo all those words. Um, I, uh, our family, as many of you know, would park. We would park here over the holidays, and uh, this is like our second uh, church home. And uh, just so thankful for all the kindness of the church here. And uh, so, um, Caleb was picking us up from uh, the airport, and um, he he said, "So, like, what's your favorite thing about uh, this area?" And I said, "I think your church. I think your parking lot. That's my favorite." And um, I mean, seriously, when we would come here, I, I would hardly go anywhere. I wouldn't even, I mean, I'd, I'd be in one of those little classrooms writing papers for school and in that, um, in that trailer out there. And, uh, and sometimes, though, we would sneak around here and play laser tag, okay? So, um, but we just so appreciated uh, those times. We appreciate the partnership with the church and uh, so love um, your heart for missions abroad. Uh, locally, um, and then in Utah as well, and just your other missions emphasis, and just so thankful for uh, your care for the gospel. And yet this, um, uh, by the way, I'll be sharing a little bit more about our, our, um, what the Lord's doing in our ministry tomorrow morning um, uh, as, as we're able to. Uh, but sometimes as we look out for missions, I think sometimes we forget our own responsibility to make disciples. I think sometimes we just get busy. I mean, I, I know what it's like. I mean, we so loved our years on the road, those 20 years that, uh, 25 years actually, if you count uh, time that we we're single, where all we did is we'd drive on Saturday, go to the next church, we'd preach the gospel, and it was a blessing. And um, there were many opportunities in the course of the week to give the gospel to complete strangers that come to the service, and we'd sit down after the, the service or... Christy with the children's ministry and able just to continually give the gospel. We lived a very, um, we vi- lived a very focused life and very minimalistic. I mean, if it didn't fit in the trailer, it went in the dumpster, right? And so we were able just to live a, a very focused life of evangelism. Additionally, we had about uh, anywhere from four to eight um, young adults that traveled with us and they would be in our trailer Sunday night and then we'd have them uh, we'd have to do a Bible study and do devotions with them on Monday. You know, it was a very focused life. Uh, we were able to proclaim the gospel. We were able to just disciple people in following Jesus Christ. And it was a blessing. And so now that we're relocated to Salt Lake City, there, there's so many other distractions with living in a home. Are there not? There's so many distractions with just life. There's so many distractions with our culture that sometimes some of us, we forget our need to evangelize and make disciples because we're busy. I think sometimes we um, forget to make disciples and we forget to evangelize um, because, well, the cultural forces around us. Um, how, How many of you liked the introverted effect of COVID. I'm just curious. About 50% of you should raise your hand slowly. Um, my wife and I commented, it, it, there was a season when, you know, we, it first came out and we weren't sure the serious, how serious this was yet. And I, at least in Utah, there was kind of like a three, four week lockdown. And um, man, Christy and I, it's funny, we kind of, we were just as a family and it was kind of nice in one sense, you know? It was kind of, a, we needed a, probably a break or something. And, and yet, really going out and talking with folks afterwards, have you noticed that talking to people is different? Have you noticed that? Not quite sure where they're at. Do they want to talk to you? Will they talk to you? Are you being too forward? You know, do you, I, I wish I could just wear a sign. I, I already had COVID, I promise. I wish we could just wear a bracelet, you know. I'm, I'm all good right now. And yet there's, there's a little bit of a, a, a wall there. But, but that cultural aspect of COVID, it's always been there. there there's a cultural aspect of, of secularism where people are like, ah, you know, you got, uh, I don't know, that you got your little church thing, that's great, but I got my little non-church thing. Or, or maybe it's a, a, a touch of relativism. You've got your truth and I've got my truth and we're, we're all speaking truth. Or maybe, um, maybe it's... Um, a, a, a little bit of um, just, I don't even want to, I don't, I, don't, I don't trust you. 
I, I, think that, I think you probably voted for somebody I don't like or I don't trust you. I don't think you think the same way I think about economics or race or politics or whatever else. In fact, in our culture, what I'm finding is that Christians are losing heart. Christians are actually becoming pessimistic about the gospel. There's some that are just fatalistic. They're basically saying, you know what, the gospel, it started in Jerusalem, and then it kind of spread out, and, and, you know, and it was in Europe for a while, and then over in North America, and then from North America, there was a lot of missionary work from England and North America and, uh, into the, the, the global south, which would be the continents of South America and, and Africa, and, you know, well, the, the gospel is just kind of moving through the United States like it kind of did through Europe, and I mean, do you know there's there's more Christians in China than there are citizens of the United States of America. And well, you know what? The Philippines and actually South, South Korea is almost sending out more missionaries than the United States. And so, you know, well, gospel's just kind of, it was here and now it's just going to go and we're just going to go just like Europe. I mean, we're just, and it's kind of a fatalism. But, but I don't think any of those isms please God. I don't, I don't think that that's what God wants us to do. I, I don't think God just wants us to just lay over and go like, yeah, whatever is going to happen, and it's going to happen. I'm just not going to do anything. No, I don't think God really wants us to lose heart. And I think as we come here to a missions conference and we think about places like Utah, since this is more of a, a domestic focus, and we think about places like uh, Decatur, and we, we think about places uh, like, like are represented this week, I, I think sometimes we, got, we have to understand something, that, that our best missionary effort is going to come when our hearts are warmed in our own personal lives in the area of evangelism. And we cannot lose heart in this. This is not something we delegate. This isn't something we just send checks to. This is to be what Christians do. No no matter how dark the age, no matter how scary it is to you, there's a lot of optimism because God's on the throne. And God's doing a work. And the message of Christ still saves people. I mean, have have you interacted with enough people to just know that materialism does not save anyone? That hedonism does not save people. That relativism does not take care of people's sin. The bankruptcy of life without God is still prevalent today. But Jesus Christ and his good news is enough to redeem and change people and make them followers of him. And the message of Christ did not lose power somehow this year. The, the message of Christ is not thwarted by, by, by uh, pandemics. The, the message of Jesus is not thwarted by anything that's going on around us. No, no, Christ is still in the business of saving people. So, so how are we to live a life of ministry in a culture that redefines truth and undermines sp- scriptural authority and challenges everything? I mean, how can we communicate the sufficiency of Christ to our culture? I'm thankful that God gave us the Apostle Paul as an example. Uh, if you take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians 4, that's where uh, Pastor Ryan read... Maybe don't turn over to it, but later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul just recounts his life. I I just think it's helpful for us to be reminded that first century Mediterranean was not a skip in the park. First century Mediterranean had all sorts of issues, many of the same issues that we have today. I, 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 for, a, for a class, I did a New Testament uh, survey that was actually focused on the culture, and it was focused on the Greco-Roman world and all the idolatry and all the sensuality and all the pornography and all the issues that were taking place in first century Mediterranean. It's just overwhelmingly gross. And yet Paul endures all of those hardships. 2 Corinthians 11, he, he says, hey, I, I, was, I was imprisoned. I was beat. I, I was part of shipwrecks. There was hunger, sleepless nights, constant pressure about the health of the churches. False teachers are, are like accusing me of being dishonest. In fact, that's what's going on in the book of, of Corinthians. He's, he's actually defending himself because they were saying you're weak in your message. And Paul's like, no, I'm not going to lose heart. I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And coming back to our text here in 2 Corinthians, I think I said first, but 2 Corinthians 4, Paul declares that 
and, and displays what true ministry should look like in the midst of a hostile environment. And it reminds us that the message of Christ is sufficient. If I was to boil it down into a big idea that we could walk away with, it's this, to live a life that communicates the sufficiency of Christ to our culture. We must have a ministry that's authentic and a message that exalts Christ. We must have a ministry that's authentic. That's going to be point number one. And point number two is we must declare a message that exalts Jesus Christ. There must be this authentic transparency and there must be this intentional preaching of Jesus Christ. We heard Ryan read this, and so I won't reread it right here. But look what he does in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose hope. So, so I want you just to take stock. Let's make this personal here on this Friday night. I want you to think of somebody that by God's grace, you're burdened that they'd be saved. I'm, I'm not talking about somebody far away. I'm not even, I, I don't even want to really talk about a relative that you've been engaging with the gospel over the last decade or so. I want you to think of somebody in your immediate context context, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody in your workplace, somebody in some social group, who is it that you're thinking about in reaching with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Can you think of them? How are things going right now? Like on a scale of one to 10, how effective do you feel right now in sharing your faith with them? My, uh, my wife and I, there, there's a, a number of folks in our life that I probably, because of the nature of the live stream, I, I, I don't want to tell you all of the details about them, but there, there are some people that we just love with all of our heart that we've known our entire time as we've been relocated to our, our present setting. And I have some numbers in my mind. What are yours? Can the gospel still work in their life? Is the gospel at work in their life? Is Jesus still sufficient? So to live a life that actually communicates the sufficiency of Christ, we must have a ministry that is authentic. So since we have this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. It's, 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 a, it's good for us right now as we dive into this first point, just to think about our culture. Do you know that our culture right now is not asking if Christianity is true? Like that, that's really a, 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 a modern way to look at something or something from modernity. Is it true? There is, does that match up to a truth claim? But, but that way of thinking has moved on. Our, our culture doesn't ask questions like, is it true? They, they would twi- swi- switch it. They'd, they'd move it into the form of relativism and they'd say, is that true for you? So for something that they view as true for me, but not quite true for them, the what bridges the gap is another question, and it's this, is that real? Now, I I don't want you to to, to get lost on me here. I'm not saying that there is not absolute truth. I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for some form of relativism, relativism. I'm just saying that's where our culture is. Our culture is not asking, if if you're to go to your neighbor tonight and you're to say, hey, I just heard a message that was just trying to stir me up to share the message of Jesus Christ, and I just want to share that with you because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They wouldn't look at you and say, so, is it true? They would just assume that you think it's true for you. And they would stand there and they would just be like, oh, great, thanks for sharing that. Thank you so much. That sounds like it means a lot to you. I just am so thankful you came over to share what you think is true for you. So how do we bridge that gap? We bridge that gap by answering the question that they're asking all the time. Is it real? That's why we grieve when... National leaders claim to be Christians and don't look like Christians. That's why we grieve when people mingle politics and Christianity. That's why we grieve when people are, they they mingle their personal life that's a wreck and say they go to church on Sunday. 
because it makes it even more difficult to bridge the gap. And that's why Paul, he's saying, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, I, I don't lose heart. I, we renounce disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. But by open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves. I, I just want you to say, here I am. I, I really have been redeemed. Like, like, you can ask me, you can ask my wife, you can ask my kids, you can ask my neighbors. Yeah, he's maybe not what he ought to be, but God's grace is all around him. He, he, his, his message, his life matches his message. By the way, you can have this authentic type of ministry because we've actually received our ministry from God. I, I'm just so glad that this is not like a ministry I created. I'm just so glad this is not something I came up with myself. I, I, I just am so glad that actually the reason why I can have this ministry that's authentic is because I've received this ministry from God. Where, where do we see that? Well, well, actually, we don't see it in chapter 4. We see it in chapter 3. And D.A. Carson, in talking about this text, he said, do you see that first word, therefore? for any and he went dad joke he went full on dad joke he said whenever you see therefore you have to see what it's there for now with a bunch of pastors he might get a little chuckle <laughs> but with us we're like thanks dad but to see what it's there for, we go back, and in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, but as men as sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. This ministry that I'm talking about, well, he's, Paul says it later in verse 5, we preach not ourselves. This is not a Galkanese message. This is not like Galkan for downtown, um, downtown Salt Lake City. It's, it's, not, it's not Peterson message for Lebanon. Or Roswell. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not mechanic message for Decatur. This is actually the message that we received from God. It's not ourselves. This is not coming from us. We can all be tempted to lose heart. We can all be tempted to run in cowardice. When we forget that this ministry that we have is actually given to us from God. This isn't our kingdom. This isn't our little fiefdom. This isn't something that we set up for ourselves. We don't deserve this opportunity to serve others. We don't have the capacity to impart life. You, you, don't, you can't save anyone. I have no power to save anyone. And so therefore, I don't really need to defend myself to the culture around me. I don't have to defend myself to those that are around me. If, if I'm just living what I've received from God, Head over to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? You see what's going on here is these false teachers are saying, Paul, you're not, you're not really sent from God. Paul, you're not that awesome. Paul, you, you don't have it. You, you're not, you, you don't really, uh, you don't, I, we don't believe you. And so Paul's response was not to defend himself, but he's saying, no, I, I'm not, I have, there's nothing of me. I've actually received this from God, and God has done a work in your life. In fact, look at verse 2 of chapter 3, and, and he's talking to the Corinthians. He said, you yourselves are our letter, letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all, and you show that you're a letter from Christ, Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Paul said, I can't do what has happened in your life. God did that. Um, last Sunday, or was it two Sundays? I'm kind of a wreck right now. I can't remember. I've been like on the road for two weeks. Anyway, my last, it was, it was Valentine's Day. So how many Sundays that was, that's when it was. I baptized this guy. Big old cop. Big. Emphasis on big. 
I don't do a lot of baptisms. I don't do a lot of weddings. I don't do a lot of funerals. I get scared every single time. I'm just like a preacher. I'm like, like there's really awesome pastors. I'm like, I'm like an okay pastor, but I'm just like, I'm more like, like, you know, like what I'm doing. I'm not, you know, th there's guys that do that all the time and I'm baptizing this guy and I'm trying to remember everything. I'm trying to remember all the words I'm supposed to say, right? I'm trying to remember. I got it. I got it. I baptize you in the name of the father, the son. And I go down and he goes down and he's like two feet. 50 maybe. I'm a big guy. I'm like, oh no, I'm going to lose him. He must have sensed my insecurity because I think he put his foot back and gave me some assist. And so I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son. And then I'm like, Holy Spirit! Congregation cheers, laughs, you know. Um, I didn't save him. I have no capacity to change that man's life. In fact, his testimony, he talks about the idols that blinded him and gave him self-righteousness. And in his job, his, and he's in a bad section of the police force. I mean, it's like he, do, he deals with like just all sorts of internet crime that's just like so evil that he said, because I deal with so many evil, evil people, I justified myself. And I felt like I, I didn't really need Jesus. I didn't see myself as a sinner. But can I tell you something? God broke through. And that's what Paul's doing. Paul's saying, yeah, I know, I know, I'm, I know I don't speak with eloquence. Yeah, I know I'm not quite there. But can I tell you something? This ministry that you're feeling, this isn't my ministry. This is God's ministry that he put in me. And look what happens. He says, I, I, he goes, verse 4, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. So 2 Corinthians 3, verse 4, he says, this is the confidence we have from God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is of God. Your neighbor, your neighbor that is just thoroughly immersed in secular society, the relativism that drips down your street, all of the false idols that are so readily available here in the affluent Atlanta South, can I just tell you something? Aren't you glad you're not the one that has to save people? Aren't you glad it's God who gave you this ministry that results in life? Look what he does. He continues in verse 6. For who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. He takes the, and, and he just describes, this is the work of the law, and this is the work of grace found in Jesus Christ. This is the old covenant, the letter of the law, the ministry of death and condemnation, the tablets of stone, the veiled face of God, and the new covenant of the Spirit, the ministry of life freedom, soft hearts, unveiled glory. The new covenant produces life, gives righteousness, is permanent, brings hope, is clear, is energized by the Spirit, transformed, and all because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Sometimes when we, when we live in a culture that is just immersed in Christianese, we reduce our Christianity to a nine to five profession or something we do on Sunday or something that we all do because we grew up there. Can I tell you something? The only reason why you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior is because of the work of the Spirit of God in your life. It didn't come about because of your geographical location. It didn't come about because of your own righteousness. It didn't come about because you grew up somewhere. Can I tell you something? If you know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, it has been a work of God that has produced life. And Paul takes this and he says, so, so you glory in Moses, those, you glory in the work of God under the old covenant. How much more should you glory in the new covenant work of Christ the Spirit? Look at verse 9 explicitly. Let me give it to you from another translation. He says, if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? 
You see, you truly can have an authentic ministry because this ministry that God's called you to is a ministry from God, and it's a ministry that results in new life. Christy and I, we are, I was preaching at a, at a church in Salt Lake City, and she was singing, and I was preaching, and we saw this, this lady that the whole time she just had this just huge smile, like joy, just beaming out of her. And so Christy and I tri triangulated onto her, right? We're like, yeah. And we're like, what's your story? She said, well, I got, sa I, I, no, I got, I got married in the temple, referring to the temple of Jesus, uh, temple of um, followers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And she said, I got married in the temple. But about eight years ago, I came into this church because I just, I don't know, I just, I just wanted to know the Bible. And, I, and I, I asked the pastor, I said, do you think we could do a Bible study? That was me and my, my friend. And, and the pastor said, sure, let's start reading the book of Romans together. You know, go big or go home. And halfway through this Bible study, this lady, she said, I just, the light bulb was going on. And she said, my friend stopped going to the Bible study because she knew, she started counting the cost of losing everything. She said, eight years ago, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And she said, God changed everything about me. But she said, I lost everything. My husband divorced me. I lost my job because of it. And she's smiling this whole time. And... Um, and then she kind of threw in another story in the middle. She's like, she's telling us about her life. And she goes, you know, I met my friend. She's talking about the girlfriend that was started the Bible study, but ended the Bible study. I met my friend two years ago in the grocery store. And this friend, and she came up to me. She said, it's like you died. I don't know where you've been. Where have you been? It's like I haven't even seen you. And this Christian lady, she goes, oh, I did die. But now I'm alive. Sometimes we all forget. We were dead in our trespasses. We were stony cold. But God. He cracked it open. He showed us his love. Oh, you can. You can have a real ministry in today's culture. You can have a real ministry to your neighbor, to your friend, to, to people around you. Why? Because the ministry that you've been called to is one that's been given to us by God and it results in life and is a manifestation of God's mercy. I think I, it's good for us. It's good for us to remember the mercy we received right here in the first verse back in chapter 4. Therefore, we looked, we looked back. We saw that in two and three, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose hope. The mercy that we receive because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Why are you here on a Friday night? Because you received mercy. Paul got this. He's talking to Timothy. He said, though, formerly, formerly I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I, I was an opponent. But, but I received mercy. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And the saying is trustworthy and deserving of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners among whom I am the foremost. Verse 16 of 1 Timothy 1. But I receive mercy for this reason. Having received mercy. Mercy, but God being rich in mercy because of, his great, because of his great love, which he loved us. We receive mercy. Titus 3, 5, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. I, I just want us to walk out of here just beginning to realize, you know what, for me to focus on people rejecting me, for me to, to be fearful of people not liking me, for, for me to think that those people can't be saved is such a misplaced focus. We've forgotten that God... God is the one who is at work. There's freedom. Back in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
And we all, with unfailed face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from one degree to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, when we're tempted to lose heart, we have forgotten we've been shown mercy ourselves. When we lose heart, we forgot that God's life was imparted into us through the Spirit of God. When we lose heart, we forget the responsibility of being given a ministry by God. Sam Storm said this, if you should ever think that your position in the kingdom is a reward rather than a gift, there will be little to sustain you in seasons of hardship and anguish. I'll repeat that again, but let me just go ahead and explain it. He's, he's saying this, if, if I think that somehow I earned my standing and the reason I'm a Christian is because of my own good behavior when it comes to something that's impossible like postmodernism and relativism and pluralism. It's impossible to debate. I go, come with me and to, to Utah and, and try to debate people that have no clear doctrine. I'm telling you, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. You'll never out-debate he goes, but when you forget that you're a recipient of that type of power, when you start going outwards, you're going to faint. So let me read the quote again. If you should ever think that your position in the kingdom is a reward rather than a gift, there will be little to sustain you in seasons of hardship and anguish. But we receive mercy and others can as well. You see, I, I told us that authentic ministry is possible because we've received this ministry from God, but this ministry is authentic, or let me say it this way, authentic ministry is visible when we practice it with integrity. So, so it's possible because we've received it from God, but it's visible when we practice this ministry with integrity. That, this is where I was going at the very beginning of our message. Remember I said, people aren't asking, is Christianity true? People are asking, is Christianity real? And Paul backs this up. He said, so this ministry you've received is from me, but this ministry... When you practice it with integrity, it has a powerful impact on those that are around you. Therefore, our ministry must be honest. Look at verse 2. But we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. This is kind of a restatement of something that he said earlier in chapter 2 and verse 17. He said, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, as men, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Paul refuses, renounced, to be connected with the message of the false teachers. He says, I, I just, uh, I renounce, or I, I, I'm not going to deal in disgraceful, underhanded ways. I'm, there's not, I'm not going to do anything sneaky or shameful. Can, can you see why I'm connecting the dots of why it's so important that Christians look like Christians? Are you connecting the dots for somebody to say that they're a Christian but live like somebody's not a Christian? Do you see why it's a problem? So for us, our direct, KC, you, you, you know this very well, but we have missions teams that come out, you know, like the Lebanon kids with teens, young adults, big people. And we'll go to the temple um, and we just kind of let them meet folks. I can remember a specific time we had a group of Midwest kids. I, seriously, small town, Midwest, USA. I don't think they'd ever met a Mormon before in their entire life. And they're, they're at the temple and we sit down for the little tour and they're, they call themselves sisters, the female missionary representatives of the church. And these sisters uh, were all friendly. They've all got kind of the same look. They're just happy and friendly and they're just doing their mission and they're just all happy and they're like, so why did you come to Utah? And this, um, and this seventh grade boy, you know, he's kind of not sure why he's here yet, but he, he goes, we're here as, we're here on a missions trip. And the, the, the sister goes, oh, are you Christians? And the, the boy's like, uh-huh. And the, the, the sister's like, us too? And this boy's like, huh? And she goes, Our, we're Christians. Our name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. See, we even have Jesus Christ in our name. Ugh. And she's going on, and all these Midwest kids, they're just kind of going, 
oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I mean, it just, it just kind of rattled them. They're just like, here they are coming to Utah to give the gospel to Mormons, and Mormons just said, we don't need the gospel because we got it. I'm just sitting there. I'm waiting for some good questions, and they're not asking any questions. So finally, I just raised my hand. I said, so um, I just, well, when did Jesus Christ become God? And this girl, who was all sweet about five minutes ago, she goes, oh, he's not God. And all the, all the kids go, oh. <laughs> and the tour continued, and this girl, she was up. She turned out she'd done, she'd actually, she was English, and she did a philosophy degree, and she's really tricksy. And she came up to me and she goes, I just don't understand why you're trying to make a big deal about this. I mean, we're Christians and you're Christians. And, and I, I'm just listening to this. I didn't, I didn't, when we usually go to the temple, we don't try to force gospel conversations. But she's just nailing me and drilling me. And, and I said, well, I, okay, if you want to talk, I, so, so if you're Christians like us, and we've not changed since 300 AD, why are you saying that you have to restore us specifically in the doctrine of the Trinity? We have believe in the Trinity all along the way. Are you Trinitarian too? She goes, oh no, we are not Trinitarian Christians. <laughs> Think through that one for a second. Then why is she being so tricksy? Why, why didn't she just say, hey, we don't believe in the Trinity. We don't believe in the sufficiency of God's word. We actually add to it four other main scriptures. And every six months when our prophet speaks, some of those things are actually new revelations for us to follow right now. Why, why did she not say that? Because can I tell you something? All false religions have something tricksy to them. But can I tell you, you as a Christian have nothing tricksy about you. This is what you believe, right? The most published book in the world is there for everybody to see. I don't have anything to hide. I come from Idaho. Conspiracies, you know what I mean? They're like real conspiracies. I mean, they're everywhere. Can I tell you something? If they round me up, they're going to know that Will Galkin believes this book right here. I have nothing to hide. I don't have a little secret handshake. I don't have anything hidden. I mean, this is all I believe. This is all my only hope. And therefore, do you know what this means? This frees you. You can just be honest. You don't have to hide the gospel from your neighbor. They already know what you believe. You don't, you don't have anything else. There's no leveling up. There's no little dark room in the back. There's nothing. Like they already, this is all we have. And so therefore, we renounce disgraceful, underhanded ways. We, we refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. We're not peddlers. We're not some huckster. We're not like taking a little bit of God's word and changing it just a little bit so we can make a buck or two. No, we just want people to know the word. Without this word, people die. That's why our ministry is just honest. We're just, we're just, we can practice this. This authentic ministry is visible when we just practice it with integrity. And, and that's why we must be honest and we must be transparent. And that's why in verse 2 he says, And by open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Like, since I have nothing to hide, I want my life practice to be matched up with my doctrine. Or, or what, how they'd say this, that the theologians of, theologians of old, they'd say that my orthodoxy, my, my proper doctrine, ought to be connected with my orthopraxy, the way that I'm living. It's just like, like there ought to be an authenticity, authenticity from my, my belief on Sunday with my life Monday through Friday, Saturday. Like, like people in the workplace, they don't know you as the guy that goes to a Christian church. They know you as a Christian. Your neighbor doesn't know that you just kind of do some stuff on Sunday to set up, you know, to, to go do something. They should know something about your life is so authentically Christ-like. You have nothing to hide. You have nothing to prove. So therefore, here's my life. You want to you see what a Christian looks like? That's scary, isn't it? I have nothing to hide, nothing to prove. You can know anything about me. But this is the type of ministry that cuts through all of the isms of our culture today. Because at the end of the day, 
Can I tell you what Mormonism produces? I'll just talk my context. You can talk yours. Do you know what legalism produces? The highest rate of prescription drug abuse, rate of prescription drug abuse in the nation. That's what it produces. You know what legalism produces? The highest cable, subscri- the highest cable porn subscription in the nation. That's what it produces. You know what it produces? Highest attempted female suicide in the nation. That's what legalism produces. Hiddenness, secrets. Hmm. Doesn't look like Mormonism saves. But God saves. He can take that woman who tried to hang herself and he can set her free. He can take that guy that's popping the pills and put his spirit inside. None of those isms save. But for some reason, when we go and shout and live differently, they don't hear us. But when we preach the gospel and live authentically, it rings true. We must, we must have a ministry that's authentic. But let me get to the second point and then we'll be done. We must have a message or we must declare a message that exalts Christ. Verse four and six, four through six, he says, in the case, uh, the God of this world, let me back up, verse three, and even our gospel's veiled, it's veiled to them who are perishing. So, so if I'm not living this authentic Christian life, right? If I'm not living an authentic Christian life where I'm a recipient of mercy, this recipient of mercy that's just living authentically, he says, if, if, our gospel's veiled, like people can't see it, then it's veiled to those who are pay, uh, perishing. And in their case, the God of this world blind the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. You see, so if I'm muted, it just, it's just fits quite well into the plan of the enemy because the enemy seeks to blind the hearts of unbelievers. So, so Paul's been so open that if people do not see, so he said, I've been so open that if you don't see, then you've actually been blinded by the God of this world. And, and Satan loves to blind people from hearing just the basic truths of the gospel. I mean, that, that's why Satan uses different means and different vices, whether it's governmental or whether it's social or whether it's uh, really driven by the arts of the world. He'll do anything to blind people or, or drown out any gospel, any, any message of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, anything about Jesus that can be muted. That's what the enemy wants to do. But, but he's not just blinding, blinding people to the, the facts of the gospel. He's actually sometimes waters down the gospel. In our, in our Mormon context, sadly, there are Christian churches that, that speak so little of Jesus and speak so much of just God, like this kind of, this terminology God, and there's no deconstruction of the Mormon God that there's folks that they'll just kind of, they'll just kind of participate, but they've never yielded their knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There, there's Christian musicians that will come to town and, and the, the, the state will flock to hear these musicians. But the reason being is there's no gospel. There's no death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the God, the, Jesus, God the eternal, the, let me say it this way, God the Son. It's, it's like just kind of Jesus the example. Satan will use any means possible, like where people can't hear, or maybe a false Jesus, or... But ultimately, do you know what do you know what Satan's trying to blind people of? The beauty of Jesus Christ, God the eternal Son. Because when people see the glory of Christ, the battle's over. Like, like seriously. When the when the blinders off and they see Jesus as the co-eternal God, it's like the battle's over. Like, he's, he's God, co-equal with the Father. That's what I was trying to say. He is done. My, my, my bod, been hearing gospel stuff for a lot of years. He was sitting in a sermon. 
like six months ago, eight months ago. And he said, for the first time, for the first time I realized I was just as wicked as those people that we arrested. For the first time in my life, I saw that I was just as vile. He described those people's vileness. But you know what was beautiful? He said, no sooner did I see that I was a sinner, I just cried out to Jesus. <laughs> like, when you see the beauty of the Savior that can forgive us of our sin, and you see the transcendent glory of Jesus, who, well, Philippians 2 says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what the enemy does not want people to see, the glory of Jesus Christ. They want all the benefits of Jesus. They want a pseudo Jesus, but they don't want the lordship of Jesus. But remind yourself, he is in the image of God. That's what it said right there in verse four, to keep them from seeing the light of the good news of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. And that's why the enemy will use whatever means possible He's a dirty player. He'll use people's good works of common grace. He'll use like little, little just whispers of, of righteousness and turn it into a blinding self-righteousness. He will let false philosophies and superstitions and materialism and sensual passions. He'll do whatever it takes to blind people from the beauty of Jesus Christ. Now do you understand where we're going with this? You see, if I combine the problem of people's blindness with the timidity of the preacher there's a real problem like like what is it what is the means of grace what does God use to crack open people's blind eyes how does he slice the cataracts off their eyes it's not by being a purveyor of some watered down text it's not by just giving a little bit of the gospel that's not the answer that's not what our culture needs our culture needs the pure gospel of Jesus Christ coming out through the lives of those that have been so transformed that they can obey the second commandment to love their neighbor as much as they love themselves and to just love the people around them and to model it and to speak it because all of this if the enemy causes people, uh, if the enemy is, is, seeks to blind the eyes of unbelievers and, it, and it's not really us, that's why in verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord who is it that can open up the eyes? God can what we proclaim is not ourselves verse 6, for God said, let the light shine out of darkness. And he's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Only God can do this. I've seen this a number of times over the last eight years. It's just been so, so wonderful to see somebody blinded in their own system, blinded with a, a cultural, powerful uh, blinders, and to see God just busted open. It's like he, he delights in throwing these flashbang grenades and just causing people to see. He uses the creation motif. What I mean by that is like in, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, there's some of the same carryover words. And it's like God in creation, you know, it's like in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And that's what is being referred to here. And Paul, he says this, when God who said, let darkness shine, let light shine out of darkness. And it says, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. You see, God shines the light in. God turns the light bulb on, which is what? It's the glory of Jesus. But how? is through the knowledge of the gospel that goes into the hearts and minds. And so that's where we've been going with all of this. You see, if we just, if we just live, an, in, if we live an, an ineffective life or a, 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 a life that's not authentic, we just participate in, in the, really the sham of the enemy who's just blinding the eyes of those that are around us. We don't preach ourselves. But we preach Christ Jesus the Lord. Why? 
Because that's the means that God has ordained to pierce through darkness. That's what happens. The gospel goes in the ears. The gospel comes in through the eyes. The gospel is modeled by those around. And it sits there. All the false isms fail to deliver. The affections are stirred up for more. Common grace causes people to say, there's something bigger than me. A specific call of God begins to crack open the heart. God takes his words that do not return void. God produces life. That's why in verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We preach Christ, Jesus, the incarnate Savior, Christ. He is the anointed one, the Messiah, Lord. He's resurrected to position of lordship. This is the good news. We were slaves to sin, and now we can be servants of the gospel. He shines his light into our hearts so we can be his servant. Some of my favorite verses in the context of this whole section is over in 2 Corinthians 5. You can turn there. Verse 11. So sometimes I think that there was an era where people delighted in like shouting the gospel without living out the gospel. There was some that reacted and almost said, stop shouting, just live it. But an authentic Christian lives it and speaks it. In fact, the circles return. Look what he does in verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. <laughs> like when you have a confidence that God's at work, when you have a confidence that God will reign, when you have a confidence that the gospel still is the power of God and salvation today, you know what, there, there's, a, there's a confidence. When you know that you can't hide what you really believe because anyone can read what you believe in the Bible, do you know what, there, there's a confidence. And so now look at verse 20. Therefore, he says of chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. We're just going to take a message, the message from the king. We're not going to preach ourselves. We're just going to take what he said the, as ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Just, just listen to some of those verbs and adjectives and adverbs. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. I'm just going to take his message. God's the one that's actually working in you through us. But what does Paul say he does? We implore you. Like, I can see specific people I love in Utah right now in my mind's eye. And there's a couple of them. I've just, I've, I've, I've said pieces of the gospel. Um, I've tried to give more of the gospel. They shut it down. But there's going to come a day where I have nothing to lose. I, I can think of one specific person. There's going to come a day when I just, I'm like, I beg you, I pray you, I implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This isn't my message. The one who made you will judge you. But that judgment can fall on his son who died for you. And rose again so you can walk with God. I know I've shared this with you before, but it fits here. David Hasefluk in Dispatches from the Front. It's the second video. Little interview on the back. He, he planted two churches in Albania. And Tim, the videographer, he, or the 
the narrator. Um, Albania is just like, it's just difficult. It was a communist country, so it's half atheist, but it's Islamic. It's, it's a brutal country to start a Christian church. And he saw two churches planted. And this, this video has been out 10 years ago, so maybe there's been more fruit. I don't know. But um, kind of novel. Tim Cassie's like, so, so what was your strategy? And Hasa Fluke, he's like just so unassuming in the video. He goes, well, I wake up. You're like, oh, oh Yeah. I pray, and I meet people, I tell them about Jesus. You know, um, Ryan, you can identify with this. We're, he and I, we're always looking on the big strategic level. <laughs> want to go here, want to go here, want to go here, and we're going to do this. And like, um, but what about like my neighbor and the people I live by? Wake up. Pray, meet people, tell them about Jesus. And maybe, maybe God would take some of these few words in the missions conference over the weekend, this missions emphasis. And um, some of us would be like, okay, yeah, I want, I'm, I want to give money towards that far away. Maybe some of us in here be like, I want to go far away. But what if what just came out of this little weekend focus is that some of us said, okay, what, what about me? And how can I take this ministry from God and just preach Christ? Wouldn't that be a sweet thing? Can we pray together? Can you pray for the one that you see? I'm going to pray for two people in my mind's eye. You pray for some people. Lord, thank you that we're not coming up with our own words, but we just have your gospel to communicate. We're just ambassadors. We're just taking what you've given us and sharing it with those around us. In Jesus' name.